So, well, th thank you for, for sticking around after the, the keynote. I know this is a letdown, but uh, I'll do my best to uh, be informative and entertaining for now all, all five of you. Thank you. Um, talks on uh, just the Hanford nuclear site cleanup. And um, how many of you are familiar with the cleanup, sort of? Okay, good. I'm going to say a little bit about the cleanup itself, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about a uh, project uh, uh, like my colleague Alex uh, Zacharias and I are are working on. So Hanford, if you drive by the Hanford site, you'll see this. It's kind of an ominous, large area. I think it's, it's 586 square miles in Washington State. And one of the things to keep in mind for, the, for Hanford that's particularly important is this is the Columbia River that flows through it, uh, through the Hanford site and flows down into Oregon, which is why people in Portland, Oregon, where I'm based uh, these days, uh, uh, live. And just to give a bit, bit of uh, uh, information about this, one of the kind of extraordinary things about Hanford is most people don't know about it. So I sometimes talk to students about this, usually about 20% of the class is aware that the most contaminated nuclear waste site in the United States, maybe in the world, is uh, a couple hundred miles from uh, where they're from Portland. And they're from Portland. The students. Yes. Um, and so it's located in Richland, Washington, which is fairly close, and the Columbia River goes, it goes through it, and uh, it, was, it was chosen as, as a site to build the plutonium for the Fat Man bomb that was dropped in Nagasaki. One of the reasons they chose it is because it was fairly isolated, there was a power source, and there was a lot of water. And if you know anything about nuclear reactors, what you do is they, they generate an enormous amount of heat, and you have to run large quantities of cold water through them to keep them from, from melting, and the Columbia was helpful for this. And um, it produced about 9% of the cent of the plutonium for the 6,000 nuclear weapons that the United States built during, from 1944 to 1987. Uh, just a bit more uh, kind of very general information. It was uh, run by the Atomic Energy Commission from 1947 to 1977. Then it passed over to the Department of Energy. And it gets interesting for our purposes about 1986 because under the Freedom of Information Act, uh, what they, they did is they got about 90,000 pages of documents before 1950 uh, released into the public domain. Uh, different activist groups uh, accomplished this. And uh, before that, it was run as a military site. No information going out, small company town, uh, fairly intense loyalty by the people working on the site towards it. It was the main source of, of, of jobs. And um, so there was extreme secrecy and there was very little, actually there was lying about the amount of environmental and human damage. A couple uh, things to keep in mind uh, from 1944 to 1971, what they did is they took the, uh, the water to cool the reactors, ran it through the pipes, picked up all kinds of wonderful toxic chemicals, and then they just put it in a ditch for a while and then they put it back to the Columbia River. Um, that's not good. Um, 1945, 1951, uh, there were a number of releases of um, nuclear lines. Uh, the most significant one, um, sometimes I call the Green Run. It's not entirely clear why they did this. It was for kind of experimental purposes to get a sense of uh, what the atmosphere would look like in the Soviet Union if they were doing similar types of research. Uh, and there's an ongoing class action lawsuit uh, by the downwinders, people from the region uh, that have an extraordinarily higher rate of thyroid disease, thyroid cancer, and so on and so forth. Um, just to get a sense of the contamination, I mean, it's probably the, the, the biggest cleanup site in, in the world. So you had the hundreds of billions of uh, gallons of liquid waste dumped into the ground soil or the river. The early years, that's just what they did with it. Uh, right now, this is an ongoing issue of plumes underground rivers with different types of toxic chemicals that uh, will eventually reach the Columbia if they're not treated. There's ongoing uh, cleanup and actually debate about how it's going to be done. Uh, millions of tons of solid waste in landfills. Uh, they have these underground storage tanks, uh, and uh, what they found is they found uh, when they started the cleanup that most, I think it was a third of the single set shell tanks were leaking. And these had, yeah, again, uh, so 55 million gallons, a few million gallons leaked around the tanks. That's since being remedied, they've been transferred to tanks that are not leaking. Uh, the long-term goal is to uh, build a waste treatment and a mobilization plant, uh, which will take uh, the uh, 
or hazardous waste and enclose it in glass and then have some sort of long-term repository. Uh, one of the dirty secrets, of course, of the nuclear industry is there is no long-term depository in the world for highly active nuclear waste. Uh, Yucca Mountain was supposed to be that, but that fell apart. Uh, here's the estimated remaining cleanup costs, uh, $115 billion. Uh, I think that's a gross underestimate of what it's actually going to cost. Uh, the uh, vitrification plant so far has been $12.2 billion, and there's all kinds of scandals going on there. All right. I forgot to set my timer. Sorry about that. Now, why do I, why am I interested in this as a um, political philosopher? Well, it occurs to me that it is, it's, it's, it's a very nice case study for st studying the relationship between uh, technology and uh, democracy. And I'll explain why I think that is. So, one question, this is from Frank Laird in a 1990 article. If I put it kind of nicely, what are the necessary structural features of a participation program that will overcome uh, technocratic definitions of issues. This comes down to a fairly basic question. Uh, can ordinary non-specialist members of the public say anything of value about things like the Hanford cleanup when, quite frankly, you need an extraordinary amount of technical knowledge to say informed things about what, what's going on? Um, and this raises another question. If they should have a role, what role should they play? And one of the, the big problems, of course, is power asymmetries between technocrats, engineers, bureaucrats who are well informed, and so on and so forth, and the general public. And one way of framing this problem is, well, you might say it's the problem of bureaucratic uh, uh, domination that some political theorists have uh, tr tried to address. And this is just a problem about a, a large, complex society where science plays a major role, whether we like it or not. Um, on one hand, you want to say that the uh, country is governed by the people in some sort of sense. So if it's a democracy, people must be treated as if they're free and equal and in some sense. And we have to fill in what that sense is. You want to say that people consent to the laws that they're, they're governed by. Uh, at the same time, we necessarily uh, depend on a division of labor. None of us can be well informed about all of the important issues that impact our lives. So the specialization, which is a good thing because it allows us to do all kinds of complex things that are important, but it's dangerous because in particular bureaucrats who are not directly answerable to the public uh, get significant decision-making power. And then the question is, how can you say that even though they weren't elected, even though they're more knowledgeable than us, they are somehow accountable uh, to us? Um, and um, sort of kind of my central question is, uh, Hanford, as I'll explain in a minute, there are sort of explicit mechanisms for public um, um, participation. So there are uh, legally mandated and institutional uh, mechanisms that do uh, involve the, the public in significant ways. So it's an interesting question to look at them and try to evaluate them using democratic theory. So how well do these mechanisms address the problem of bureaucratic domination? That's the question we're trying to answer. And um, one thing in the, the back of my mind when I started this is I thought Hanford might be evidence to suggest a kind of, um, I guess, maybe leftish uh, leaning idea of deliberative or participatory democracy. Maybe this would show evidence that ordinary citizens actually can do effective things. And if not, at least it's worthwhile looking to see what they have been able to, able to do and perhaps offering some sort of su suggestions. So here's a proposal. So the public participation measures for Hanford provide a case study that allow us to get some sort of insight into the possibility of public oversight for complex technical issues uh, dominated by bureaucrats, specialists, private contractors, and so on and so forth. I got three questions. Uh, one question is to what dimensions of democracy uh, do these measures contribute? If you read a lot of official reports, agency reports, National Science Foundation documents, uh, what, what you'll find is you'll find they're not always very subtle about what they mean by democracy or uh, what different aspects of democracy might be relevant. And I'll, I'll say a little bit what I mean in, in, in a moment. Um, second question, how successful are they? And third question is, is there a way to make them more successful? All right, just a bit of institutional background because I think it's, it's useful to get a sense what's going on. It's actually taken me a long time to 
begin to get a sense of everything that's going on because you're dealing with multiple agencies, multiple laws, uh, multiple actors, and uh, this, of course, is a problem for democracy if it takes an academic several months of reading through official reports to get a sense of what's going on. But we're going to aside for a minute. So there, there's the Hanford uh, Federal Facility Agreement and Consent Order that everybody's called the Tri-Party Agreement. And Hanford, in the late 80s, moved away from being actively producing plutonium to uh, the cleanup phase. And they signed the Tri-Party Agreement that assigns roles, responsibilities, abilities, and authority, has procedures for dispute resolution, and it sets schedules for cleanup. So it's a legal document that uh, the agencies, particularly the Department of Energy, are committed to. And the Department of Energy is the one responsible for the cleanup, but there's oversight from the Environmental Protection Agency and the Washington State Department of Ecology. And these, there's different documents that mandate public participation. So there's CERCLA, um, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensa Compensation and Liability Act of 1980, that have provisions that when you're doing these types of doing assessments at different, st different stages, the public has to be consulted. Uh, there's the Resource conversation, uh, conversation, con Conservation and Recovery Act. And this gives the EPA uh, cradle to the grave authority over the disposal of hazardous waste. And again, there are provisions that the public does have to be consulted uh, there. And um, there's also, in the, the, the Tri-Party Agreement, they have the Community Re Relations Command uh, Plan. So there's public comment periods, public meetings, quarterly public involvement planning meetings, the, the meeting about the annual budget. One tidbit you should probably, you might be interested in knowing, is that every year Congress has to approve the budget. So the Department of Energy has to submit a budget, and then Congress has to decide whether to continue to fund it, and there's a public meeting uh, to that effect. Um, notably, the tri-parties consider all comments, uh, and they're available in the public record. You can access them. There is no legal binding force of them actually changing policy because of them. All right, um, my focus today is on a particular institution that's fairly unique to the Hanford cleanup. There uh, are other examples of some of the other cleanups around the United States that had advisory boards, but I, I think the Hanford advisory board is in some way uh, unique. It's lasts much longer. Uh, it's, uh, I think it has a, maybe a deeper institutional role. Um, and it, it's a representative body that provides recommendations to the tri-parties on major policy issues. Um, and um, the Fiamber Advisory Board, I'll, I'll tell you about the structure in, in, in a minute. Um, but one of the things I want, want to address today is ask about its function and uh, about the nature of the public participation measures. So I said democracy has different dimensions. You might want public participation for many different reasons, and they're not necessarily compatible, they're not even necessarily mutually uh, supportive. Um, so what you're going to say about how effective something is democratically is going to depend partly on what you want for democracy. And political theorists argue about that sort of thing. So on, on one hand, you have representation of affected interests. So on one hand, you want to make sure everybody who has a stake gets to speak. Uh, you might have certain epistemic goals. You might think that local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, is relevant, and people ought to hear that, and uh, you'll, you'll make better decisions, uh, which relates to instrumental views. You might think that if the public is involved, the cleanup uh, might go better in certain ways. Uh, legitimacy. You might think that this is just a fact about the democracies, if they're actually going to be uh, accountable to the people, need to consult the public in some sort of way. And finally, this often comes up in government reports, in agency reports, uh, public relations. You want to get the public involved, because if they feel like they've been consulted, they don't go out and picket or protest or so on and so forth. And of course, there's two sides to that. You might think that having a, a dialogue before we get to the point of protesting is a good thing. You might also think that it, it manages to just shut people up. All right. So. How's democratic theory going to help here? Well, this is from a uh, kind of a seminal article by uh, Arkan Fung, uh, who's written a lot about different participatory types of uh, democracy. And he, he suggests there's kind of three questions that are worthwhile asking. On one hand, who participates? Second, how do they communicate and make decisions? 
And third, what is the connection between their conclusions and opinions on one hand and public policy and action on, on the other? Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to analyze the Hanford Advisory Board along these dimensions. So in the first uh, question, who participates? Here's the structure. So the tripartite agencies, the Department of Energy, EPA, Washington State, State Department of Ecology, uh, all have seats on the board. Uh, Washington State Department of Health does. And then there's um, three other governments, or sorry, four other governments. There's uh, three tribal governments uh, represented. Uh, the Hanford site is actually built on tribal land. So a number of the tribes, uh, the Umatilla, the, the Yakama, in the Pacific Northwest, actually have uh, treaty rights to use the land. Uh, just an aside, this is kind of a tidbit. Uh, it was the, the Umatilla actually did a study uh, based on the levels of toxi toxicity. And they asked, uh, because the EPA says it's kind of safe to eat fish and uh, game and plants in the area, the Umatilla said maybe it's safe for people who eat salmon once a month. But if you eat it every day, every meal, uh, the levels are very, very different and very, very toxic. Uh, so tribal governments uh, have a seat on the board. My impression from observing them, talking to some of them, is they don't participate that much because they're kind of fed up with it, but that's another topic. Uh, local county and business interests have various seats. Uh, regional groups, environmental groups, have seats. Uh, the workforce, which of course is a major player, because these, these are the people involved in a daily basis in the cleanup and historically have been uh, involved with workers in the plant have seats. Washington State and University of Washington both have seats. And there's the public at large. Now the public at large is actually recruited by uh, the tri-parties. The other seats are nominated uh, by their agency or their constituency. Uh, I believe that tri-parties actually have the final say about who gets on to uh, the, the, the advisory board. Um, so that's who's, who's uh, uh, representative. Uh, and then there's the question about uh, you know, what they do, how they communicate. And what they do is they actually uh, provide formal advice and the agencies are required by the tri-party agreement to respond to the formal advice. Uh, now, uh, this usually happens. There's some cases where there isn't a response. Uh, but uh, it's worth noting that the advice is not binding. One of, one of the things we're doing, uh, my co-author and I, is, uh, are going through all the pieces of advice and the responses and trying to uh, tabulate exactly what the response is, how detailed is it, is it positive, negative, or so on and so forth, to try to get some sort of sense about what effect this has. So I'll say in a minute, it's actually very hard to do that. Um, the meetings for the Hanford, for Hanford Advisory Board are attended by the tri-party agencies. They have subcommittees to deal with particular technical issues. They're also attended. Um, and the, the style of um, democracy or decision making is deliberation and, and negotiation. Uh, one thing that we actually found really surprising, but nobody in the board seems to find surprising, is they make decisions by consensus. As a political theorist, you might wonder about that, because if you think about juries, for example, if you have one uh, member who says, hey, I'm not going to agree, even if the person's unreasonable, that's problematic. But they, they seem to have different social mechanisms for, from keeping two disagreeable people from having an impact. And that's kind of a concern as well. Um, now, what is their influence? So you can imagine a number of participatory uh, uh, institutions uh, from one in which I think this is true in Vermont, town hall meetings, they actually make policy. So they get together, they decide on something, it gets written down, and that's policy, to this type, which is mainly consultation. So recommendations have a binding force. Um, now, there may be, one of the things that I guess concerns me about looking at this is it's really hard to tell what the influence is. On the other hand, they have close interactions with agency people where they are able to bring up their concerns uh, often develop quite good relations with some people from the agencies. So they might have a great deal of indirect impact. But then again, it's, it's hard to know exactly what that is. Um, and you might think that one of the functions is to inform the general public about what, what's, uh, what's a concern. But as I mentioned, most of my students in Oregon, where they might have an interest in this topic, don't know about it, so they've been pretty unsuccessful. Kind of sadly, when you, when you go to board meetings or public meetings, you'll find that the average age is somewhere like in the low 60s. 
It's in the low 60s because sometimes I go. And, uh, um, and it's, it's often understandable because, for example, board meetings, I, I missed the one this weekend because I'm here. And it was Thursday and Friday from 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock plus, plus special sessions in the evening. Um, most people, of course, can't fit that into their schedule. Now, I'm going to just finish with a sort of preliminary uh, assessment. And this is, uh, again, very much preliminary. We're still trying to get a take on uh, what's going on here, which, uh, again, I think is problematic in itself. Uh, because the agencies that mandate these types of public consultations, uh, I mean, they're not all that interested in doing assessment of how well they're doing uh, or taking, you know, um, a, a step to show that it's meeting higher goals. Rather, they're often concerned about simply meeting their legal obligations. So, um, I'm going to just give an example. This is, I guess, one example, so uh, you're going to have to trust me that I don't think this is non-representative. Um, maybe when we finish looking at all the other examples, I'll revise that view. Uh, but this is the lifestyle style, life cycle scope schedule and cost report. Big report, important one, the Hanford Advisory Board uh, did some fairly extensive uh, uh, comments on it. And it describes uh, the scope, schedule, and cost of the Hanford Site Cleanup uh, Mission for fiscal year 2011 to 2090. Uh, the very fact that they're trying to project something into 2090 is stupid. Uh, you can't do that, but this is how agencies work. Uh, and it includes the 2011 budget and the requested 2012 budget. And this is a big deal because, again, Congress looks at this and decides whether to keep funding it or to let the people in Washington deal with the consequences. Uh, one of the things it includes is stewardship and other long-term costs. And this is one of the, the big kind of contentious issues. Um, what are you going to do if plutonium has a half-life of 10,000s of years? Uh, so once you finish the cleanup as well as you can do it, what are you going to do uh, afterwards to put different types of uh, controls in place? Uh, well, this is the board advice. The board wrote a fairly long letter documenting their concerns with the, uh, um, with, with, with the plan. And they said, you know, rather than presenting cost ranges, ranges based on the tri-party agreement legal requirements, the report frequently utilizes minimal cost alternatives. And this is always a big point of contention between environmentalist groups and board members and the Oregon State uh, Department of Energy, which is in many ways independent. Um, what sorts of estimates are you, are you going to use? What level of cleanup are you, are you going to do? Um, and obviously this has major impacts. The board claims the report is based on an assumption of extensive use of institutional controls continuing for gener generations. Uh, the board questions this assumption and finds it inconsistent with board values. So here's the issue. Uh, the issue is you might spend less money now, do a less thorough cleanup, say down to 10, 10 feet or whatever, and then leave it in place, cap it, uh, and then assume that there's going to be somebody around to say, hey, you probably shouldn't build a well here. Uh, now, the board says that's not a great strategy because we don't know if in 200 years there's actually going to be somebody saying, you know, probably not the best place to make a plant a vineyard or whatever you're going to do in that uh, uh, terrain. So it's, it's kind of a fundamental uh, dis disagreement. On the other hand, the Department of Energy is worried, understandably, about costs and uh, meeting, you know, what are their, their legal obligations because there are, there are consequences. Now, I, I use this because I, I heard this concern being brought up in public meetings and the Oregon Department of Energy actually wrote a letter to the fact of saying, uh, hey, we actually don't agree with you here. Uh, and of course, Oregon Department of Energy has their own engineers and their own their cost benefit risk analysis and so on and so forth. So they're, I mean, they're pretty serious people uh, here. Uh, here are the responses. You have the Department of Energy, thank you for your letter, campaign, the HABs, consensus advice, 252. We appreciate the HAP's interest in the subject. The U.S. Department of Energy is reviewing your advice along with comments received from other reviewers for possible incorporation to the 2013 or future releases of the Lifestyle Scope Schedule and Cost Report. That's about the extent of their letter. Uh, this is the Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA has 
reviewed uh, the report and found it to be well written huh. uh, and useful in understanding the scope, schedule, and cost for Hanford site cleanup. We believe the report satisfies DPA milestone M3618. Um, again, a legalistic response, which we see a lot. And then the Washington Department of Energy uh, did a little bit more in the response that the report meets the requirements. That's sort of the end of the conversation. Now, as I say, this is one example. So you can't draw too much from it, but I've gone through the first the last two years of the reports, and I have yet to see a single response that says, yes, we agree with you, and we're going to change our policy. I've seen responses that say, yes, we agree with you, but then they explain how they're already doing what the board's asking them to. So, um, again, I'm hoping this all revise this as we continue. Um, okay, three questions. I'm almost finished here. Uh, thank you for your indulgence. To what dimensions of democracy do these measures contribute? The board in particular, how successful are they? What, what would make them more successful? Uh, now, here are the, the dimensions again. Um, and now, I'm not entirely cynical about this. You know, the epistemic dimension, I think the have and public involvement meetings often do pretty well. You know, these are people who dedicate a large part of their time to learning about the cleanup, often with an academic background, an engineering background, a background of you know, working on the, on the site, uh, often uh, involved in environmental law and so on and so forth. I mean, these are, these are smart people. I think they probably do a pretty good job at providing information to agencies uh, otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, normative dimension, it's not clear to me that the Hanford Advisory Board actually allows us to say that the cleanup is being done according to the will of the people or with, with their consent. And one, one of the worries, of course, at Hanford Advisory Board, in many ways, is another technocratic institution. Uh, so there's not much overseeing them. Another concern, of course, is the role of private contractors. You know, the DOE is in charge of the cleanup, but they hire contractors who hire subcontractors who recently have been caught doing some kind of shady activities, including silencing engineers, or at least allegedly silencing, silencing engineers who have raised uh, risk concerns. Uh, public relations dimension, um, I think they've been fairly uh, successful, though, uh, again, the, you know, the reach of the general public is, is fairly limited. Instrumental um, dimension, again, there may be improvements in the cleanup, uh, and unfortunately, it's hard to know. You know, you can't go to any one place or to any place and get a notion of what is the relationship between public involvement and decision making. Uh, because there's no interest in tracking that, including on the explicit board advice. In fact, I think there's probably an agency rule that you can't tell the board you're going to do something because you might commit yourself to it, and that would probably be a, be a problem. So. Um, you know, the lack of explicit measures and documentation of the impact of public involvement, I think, is a basic and a fundamental issue. And uh, if you want to ask about how we can do things better, I think that's a very quick place to start. There has to be a single uh, transparent place where you can go get that information. Maybe that would be a start, a practical start for um, a uh, uh, system that better involves, uh, better uh, avoids bureaucratic domination. And 
one of the things I've heard from a couple people is the agency people will sort of tell you where they might be able to have an impact. So if you have certain proposals, they'll just say, hey, look, we're not going to listen to that, so don't waste your energy. So I, that, that's one of the questions there. Um, and it's really, it's, it's an interesting question because I think we've seen this in some of the other talks uh, over the last two days. Uh, you know, what's the, um, how do you deal with the tension between being politically relevant and saying what you really believe? You know, if the, if the board, say, took, you know, the hardest environmental line in their advice, then the agencies would shut down and make them completely irrelevant. But if they compromise, then there's the opposite worry, so. Yeah, I mean, I was wondering, the reason why I asked that is, is that, you know, you're, when you're talking about, you mentioned, made mention of, um, you know, that some of the tribal governments are fed up. Right, so this, this has been going on for some, so you actually have, like, in terms of empirical research, you have, no, you may not have oral documents, but you have, tip, like, documents from 1994, is that when it was convened? Right, so that's, that's a wealth of exchange to trace out this issue of how much public engagement has mapped onto policy outcomes. Yeah. That's so it's, it's, that's kind of amazing. I wonder if you've thought about, so I know, um, I'm at the Center for Health Economics and Policy Analysis, and there's a lot of work on public engagement in the health sector. Um, so I hear people using techniques like measuring email correspondence between people as ways of tracing knowledge from taken to policy. Have you thought about doing like research design? I'm gonna yeah, uh, actually I'd love to talk to you probably okay, yeah. um, maybe in another setting uh, yeah, yeah. about that because both my, my co-author and I were political theorists. Yeah, yeah. We're not trained in doing qualitative or quantitative research. Uh, and I suspect there's probably a couple papers that can come out of this. Uh, you know, what we've been doing is just looking at the formal advice right. and trying to categorize that in certain ways, but uh, I'd, I'd actually I'd love to hear your, your thoughts, Paul. Well, because I thought you were bringing, I, I mean, I think that the political theory is, is missing in the literature I've seen. It's mostly some sort of recognition that, so there's recognition of politics, so they'll recognize that, well, politicians use political engagement for various different means, and those kind of map onto your instrumental religion and see the public relations, but there's not a theoretical background of why we might want to and which ones we might, which uses we may want to advocate for and why, and that that might vary by situation, yeah. right? So um, I think that there is a really, it's fabulous that you're engaging with this. I mean, it's a huge issue. It's public engagement, public participation is like everywhere. In a lot of ways, it's a hot topic. So, but at the same time, it's a great work on it. Hi, Steve. Hi. Why isn't this more public science? Because I'm from Vancouver, Washington, and I've never heard of this. And I mean, we're all pretty big tree huggers there. So I feel like if we publicize this more, we get more of a movement to actually change it. Oh, we're neighbors. Yeah. Um, and I don't have a good, good answer for this. Um, you know, for example, I'm having the, I've, I've had people from the different agencies come into my classroom talk about to students. It's actually very easy to do. They're, they're eager to do that, partly because their job is public outreach. Um, but at the same time, I've talked to activists who try to get letters and just say, no, we're going here. And about the only regular news you get about Hanford is from the, the, the Richmond uh, paper up in, in Washington. Uh, you don't if you read it. If you read it, and not too many people do. Um, so it's kind of kind of baffling uh, to me why it isn't a bigger issue. I mean, just given the, the amount of expense that goes into it, you would think there would be libertarians, and we got a lot of libertarians in the area as well, you know, up in arms about having more oversight into uh, you know money that's going to contractors for things that aren't, aren't entirely clear. But uh, I, it, it may be, uh, I guess, one there was the culture of secrecy until the mid '80s where, I mean, it really was national defense, uh, you know, stay away if you're a patriotic, patriotic uh, American. Um, and then, um, I, th I think it's something about just the, the public. We, 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 we react to immediate kind of major risks. So when there was the worry about one of the reactors maybe blowing up, 
people got concerned about it. Uh, but when you say, I mean, look, they've actually, including with a lot of stimulus money that's gone into this recently, they've made a lot of progress. You know, we're not going to, nobody's going to die anytime soon. Uh, so if you, if you say, well, you know, your great-grandchildren uh, are going to have a major problem if you don't do something about this, people say, well, you know, why don't I let my grandchildren worry about that? And I, I think there's, there's a lot of that. Uh, you know, it's always, always with environmental issues. You know, a lot of people talk about climate change. It's the same sort of question. I mean, at the time that it gets urgent, it's too late to do something. And this is one of these cases. Maybe you're going to... Um, so this is sort of following on the public engagement methodological issues. Um, but there's a, an institutional analog that might be useful here that I've looked at for uh, thinking about geoengineering governance. Yeah. And it's the Madrid Protocol for the Antarctic Treaty. Okay. Um, and it was signed in 91 or something. And it's basically an attempt to govern any kind of uh, environmentally hazardous activity in Antarctica by anyone. Although really it's anyone who's, any of the countries that are party to the Antarctic Treaty System from the 50s, but that's anyone who's doing anything in Antarctica. Um, and basically it's only the parties to the treaty who have final legal say on anything. But pretty much anything that you want to do that might have serious consequences requires global public consultation. So anyone should be able to say anything. Uh, but, like the Hanford case, it's non-binding. So, you, sure, you have to go ask, um, I don't know, Madagascar, what they think. And then you say, okay, that's very nice, Madagascar, I don't care. Uh, and in fact, there's someone did a, a study of this, which might be a helpful methodological analog, or caveat. And they said, look, there's no evidence that any of this public consultation has ever made a difference. There's never been a study or an activity where someone said, we want to do X. And the public said, don't do X. And they said, OK, we won't. It's never even been, uh, we want to do X, don't do X, OK, we'll do X prime. It's always, we're going to do X. Uh, and so my I was thinking about this with some people, and one of them pointed out, you know, if the, the whole setup is really effective, that is exactly what you should expect to see. Mm -hmm. Because the people doing the projects should say to themselves, yeah. uh, this project is never going to get through. We don't want to spend two years litigating it, essentially, and then not do it. So let's make it acceptable from the start. Yeah. Um, one way you might deal with or look at whether that's going on mm -hmm. is to look at the way the agency has behaved uh, shortly before and shortly after the legislation was enacted. Yeah. See if that seems to make a difference to the behavior. Yes. Yeah, no, I have to give that some some thought. I mean, uh, it's a completely different paradigm mm -hmm. kind of before and after, so it's it's hard to Causality, but I, I'd, I'd like to be, do, do you have the reference for that study? Sure, I'll, I'll send you the snippet from paper we did that talks okay. about that and Mr. Ellen's citations. No, no, I'd, I'd love to see that. Anything else? Could you say a little bit more about the consensus? Process, yeah. You alluded to the fact that this could generate problems. Yeah, so all board advice is made by consensus. So in theory, at least, any one board member can say, hey, I do not agree with this advice. We're not going to publish it. Uh, and I mean, the actual, the process works this way. I mean, they break down into subgroups, you know, different cleanup uh, topics. And the subgroups work pretty intensely with each other and with the agencies, and they draft advice. And then it goes into the, the, the meetings. They have these two-day meetings every quarter, um, I think it's every quarter or every two months, um, where they consider the advice by the committees, revise it, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but every piece, piece there, nobody has 
exercise the right to belong in it. Uh, now, from, from a political theory standpoint, uh, there's, there's different worries about consensus. Uh, one worry is obstruction, which doesn't seem to happen that much in the board, I think because of different sociological reasons. Uh, you work intensely with people, and if you're the person saying, hey, I refuse to, uh, you know, I think that's, that's kind of difficult to do. Uh, the other worry, of course, in the democratic literature is uh, does that silence alternative views? So you can imagine an alternative type of advice where we, we could say, look, the board is split up into two ideological camps. This is what camp A says. This is what camp B says. Um, here it is. Do what you want with it. Uh, so some theories of democracy have said, well, what we need to do is we need to create a space for fruitful conflict. And there's a particular worry, say, when you have minority interests or uh, interests that are often are silenced, that consensus will have the effect of getting a false sense of agreement. So those are sort of two worries. Uh, what's interesting with talking with people is nobody seems to be aware of this, even though these are fairly basic. So you mean you're talking with people on the board? On the board. You know, we, we asked a few people, so you know, why do you use a consensus model uh, that they don't really know, or they think, well, this is great, you know, we all, we all agree. agree. Um, what could be um, more democratic? Yeah. So, how long have people been on the board? So I'm on a, I live in a housing cooperative. We own our own building, there's eight units, and everybody, we're all board members. So I'm used to how we work, and we don't function by consensus, even though we often vote unanimously. So, but I'm aware that changes in our membership can really change dynamics. So, did you have the ability to track changes in your membership, and how static is membership to the board? I think it's two year terms, but I think they're renewable. They're renewable. Do you have a sense of, like, you know, so and so, someone's been on the board for 20 years, and then there's yeah, are there a few lifers, like lifers almost. <laughs> you know, that's something we ought to do. It, it should yeah. be, uh, I mean, it's, it's a matter of the public record, it's just a matter of tracking from Because that makes a difference, right? In your decision making process, how long you've known each other. But I, I mean, my sense, I'm pretty sure about this, is people have been on for a long time. Uh, Partly because it's hard to get people who uh -huh. have that kind of commitment. So uh, certainly there'd be people who were there in the 90s. Uh, but exact turnover rates or average length of term, uh, that's what we ought to get to explicit numbers for. Um, have you looked at the WTO in consensus decision making? Uh, not in the capacity of this project. I mean, so uh, formally, uh, WTO is one country, one vote. Yeah. But in practice, decisions are made by consensus. Um, and I'm pretty sure quite a bit has been written about this yeah. uh, from a sort of political theory standpoint. And there are debates about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. But it's kind of astounding that a 157 member international body could make decisions by consensus. Um, but one of the things that seems to go on um, is, and this was the sort of board dynamics thing made me think about this, um, is that what's not done by consensus is setting the agenda. It's not clear to me how it works, but one of the really contentious issues, especially with the, the Doha round talks, is that things that the powerful states know wouldn't go their way to never come up for discussion because they don't want to have to be the ones to, to stop them. And so I wonder if you could find out, you know, are there people on the board who really control what gets discussed? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It might be a way to silence it. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm sure that, but I, I know that occurred, but uh -huh. I've attended meetings. So. <laughs> and, and it happens in any year. Uh -huh. There are a couple of people. Yeah, but there's but, a uh, difference between stonewalling and making it difficult to, right? Because yeah. that is part of the, so it, it's connecting public participation up to it's interesting, you almost have two questions, right? Because you have the, how is this board affecting policy? Then is how is this board coming to its decision that it wants to affect policy? Yeah. And they're slightly different. Yeah. So uh, which one interests you more? Well, um... Do you think they're, I don't know, what's this question for everybody? Do you think are they necessary, like, to both of them? Do you have to have answers to both of them? To I mean, as, as I say, I think there are a number of papers yeah. here that can be potentially uh, 
written um, for all sorts of different uh, purposes. Uh, maybe this is changing the question a little bit, but you know, one thing we, my co-author and I have discussed is would we be happy if the board had more power to affect policy? Would that be a good thing? And I'm, I'm not sure it would. On one hand, I'm not sure I want the technocrats of the board making decisions any more than I want the Department of Energy. <laughs> or rather, I want checks and balances is, is what, I, what I want. Uh, so, yeah. you know, this, so this is a question sort of, of institutional mechanisms. Uh, maybe the status quo, you know, because there aren't that many, you know, major deep consent, contentious issues is a lot better than it was in, say, the late 80s when you know, there was a lot of public protest. Uh, but I'm kind of interested in being able to provide evidence for that type of justification, and maybe the look at the Madrid pro Protocol, mm -hmm. research methodology. And then there's all kinds of questions. Uh, Arkin Fung, I mean, you know, writes about sort of mic micro-publics. Okay. He's, he's looked at various places around the world where they've had different types of decision-making and analyzed and so on and so forth. Uh, I think that kind of research would be mm -hmm. fascinating mm -hmm. uh, as well. I'm hoping maybe we get a paper sort of focusing on the, the democratic theory literature which I think is underexplored. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of lip service plugged to it, but, but uh, they don't really explain what they mean by democratic theory. I'm hoping we get that paper written, get published somewhere, and then maybe interest people with another skill set to, to collaborate, uh, see what happens. It sounds like you have a research program. Yeah. It's good. It's good. It's productive, it's right? It's terrible. I have fun, but my main area of research is immigration. So this is, <laughs> actually, I don't need right now, but it's, it's fun. This is how I feel about my geoengineering stuff. It's the problem that keeps on giving or keeps on taking, depending on what you're looking at. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're all for some just a home.